Good morning and thank you for joining the Fort Worth Public Library on Zoom for TCU's Center for Texas Studies Preserving Our Past Community History Workshop. I'm Linda Barrett and uh, I manage the Genealogy, Local History and Archives Unit here at the Central Library. While we're waiting for people to get logged in and uh, get any little issues worked out, I've got a few library programs coming up that I'd like to call your attention to. Um, the library programs are all available on our calendar on our the library's homepage, and I've put a link to the homepage in our chat. On the evening of Monday, May 3rd at 7 p.m., it's off the record with Grady Spencer and The Work. That's part of our Amplify 817. And the band The Works music reflects its members. Honest, good timing with a nod to blue collar roots. So that should be an interesting conversation. On Wednesday, May the 5th at 6.30 p.m., there is the Books and Brews Book Club. They will be discussing Exit West by Moshin Hamid. And then on Thursday, May the 6th at 7 p.m., Introduction to Quantum. And it's our Introduction to Quantum Computing Program. It's an interactive presentation in which uh, participants learn about this emerging technology and, a program, and program a simulated quantum computer with the help of guided examples. So I'm kind of like, wow, that is... That sounds really interesting. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Leanna Schooley. She is the Executive Director of the Center for Texas Studies. Leanna. Thank you, Linda. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is that uh, I am coming to everyone this morning live from downtown Fort Davis, Texas. Uh, I am borrowing internet from their library today. So if there are any technical difficulties or uh, motorcycle sounds uh, in the background where I am, they're having a, a motorcycle rally here this weekend. Uh, so, um, so that explains what you may see or hear that's uh, not normal to our programs. Uh, but I do want to tell you that we bring you these programs thanks to the generosity of the Summerlee Foundation and the Summerfield G. Roberts Foundation. We want to encourage everybody to be a historian and a preservationist in their own hometown. And you will very soon learn uh, that Libby is a great example of being a preservationist in her own hometown. I want to tell you that our next program is going to be sort of a special edition. Normally, May is our last program, but we are doing a special program on June 5th when we're hosting Frederick Gooding, who is the head of the Race and Reconciliation Initiative at TCU. They have just produced a report on TCU history uh, and race. And so they are going to come and talk about some of the new things that they've learned about Texas. Uh, I mean, about TCU history uh, during that program and talk about the results of their report and where the initiative will be going after this first phase is complete. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you are welcome to ask questions at any time during our program. Uh, if you would use the Q&A button, we would appreciate that. Uh, Libby will uh, take your questions at the end. and. Um, and I wanna tell you that this program, should you have to scoot out early, um, will be available on the library's YouTube channel in about seven to 10 days. And we'll try to make an announcement on our social media when it's available too. Uh, so keep that in mind. So with that, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, Libby and what she's gonna tell us today. She's going to be discussing National Register Historic Districts using uh, her own neighborhood as an example, uh, Oakhurst. Uh, she is a consultant, author, preservationist, civic leader. Um, she was the Texas Regional Administrator uh, for the National Register, uh, I mean the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Later, she became the first Executive Director of Preservation Texas. Locally, she works with the Fort Worth ISD, 
She's past president of the Fort Worth League of uh, Neighborhood Associations, and she's the author of Fort Worth's Oak Hood, Oakhurst Neighborhood. Uh, she lives in Oakhurst and was instrumental in, in getting their National Register District up and running and maintaining its integrity into the future. So with that, I'll give you Libby to tell you all about it. Libby? Thank you, Leanna. Let's start off by sharing our screen. As you know, May is National Historic Preservation Week. Uh, Leanna mentioned that I used to be, uh, years ago, the uh, Executive Director of the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, Regional Office, which worked in Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. And the trust is the one that really uh, was the, the organization that started uh, the celebration of National Historic Preservation Month. So this is near and dear to my heart. And um, I am just glad to be here and glad to uh, talk about uh, everything that uh, is involved in saving a great neighborhood, which is the title of the talk. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about Oakhurst history and its architecture and its sense of place. And you see there uh, is the iconic Oakhurst column, at least one of them at the entrance to the neighborhood. So right off the bat, you're starting to look at Oakhurst. Um, Oakhurst was listed in February 2010 uh, in the National Register of Historic Places. Oakhurst is almost a 100-year-old neighborhood now and will be in uh, 2024. Just a few fun facts about our historic district. Uh, Two-thirds of the neighborhood uh, was built uh, between 1920, 1930, 1940, those decades, and mostly Tudor style and craftsman style bungalows are, are coming to us from those decades. Another third of the neighborhood was built after World War II. That's known as the West Oakhurst edition. And actually, Oakhurst neighborhood is divided among two editions, the Oakhurst edition and the West Oakhurst edition. So those uh, structures in the West Oakhurst edition are mostly 1940s and 1950s era structures, uh, mostly ranch style houses. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we look at some of the examples of the architecture in the neighborhood. It's really like having a, a true encyclopedia of residential architecture in the country when you go through uh, Oakhurst. We have over 700 houses in the historic district and Oakhurst uh, is the largest uh, national registered district listed in Tarrant County in the past 30 years. In fact, since the Fairmount Southside Historic District was listed in 1990. Um, I want to start with some history and we're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about the architecture of the neighborhood and we'll talk about some of the defining features of the neighborhood and then we'll wind up and talk about uh, saving the neighborhood and, and the technical aspects of what it takes to save uh, a great neighborhood. If you know anything about uh, Fort Worth history, you know that uh, the Daggetts were a large part of the early history. Uh, you know that Ephraim Daggett is considered the father of Fort Worth. Well, he had a brother named Charles Daggett. And when Charles and his family came along with the other brothers in 1849, he eventually settled his family uh, in the wooded property along the Trinity River, northeast of uh, what would be downtown Fort Worth. And ultimately, it was from that property uh, in the Charles Daggett survey and the S.K. Smith surveys that the future Oakhurst neighborhood and West Oakhurst were platted. Uh, it was 1868 when Charles Daggett established the first ferry across the Trinity River, and that became known as Daggett's Crossing. And it was right about at where Mount Olivet Cemetery is today. Uh, if you think forward, uh, way past 1868 uh, into the beginning of the 20th century, this is what the map looked like. These outlines uh, were what Fort Worth or Camp Worth was. And this area here is where the Daggett property was that, that I'm talking about. Um, it's interesting to note that at the, about the same uh, time period that this was going on and after 1860, John Porter King was a young man who came to Fort Worth 
with his family. And as he, he grew up and, and got into his 20s and his 30s, he was uh, one of the, the strongest entrepreneurs that whoever uh, was, frankly, in Fort Worth. I often call him the Eamon Carter before there was an Eamon Carter. Uh, because he was interested in not only entrepreneurship and owned many, many businesses, whether it was an ice company, eventually a candy company, uh, he had a drilling company interest on and on, but he was very interested in land development. And so he was one of the young men, and here's a picture of him along with the others who were responsible for gathering the property together, which ultimately became um, Camp Bowie during uh, the World War I years. So this was uh, the foray of John Porter King into real estate in Fort Worth, and you'll hear a lot more about that. And you probably know that the 1920s was a decade of tremendous growth in Fort Worth. Uh, the population of the city at the beginning of the decade of the 20s was about 106,000, not too different uh, from my own hometown of Abilene, which was always about 100,000 during my growing up years. But uh, after that, and, and, and really this came about as a result of a lot of the oil and gas uh, development drilling activity that had gone on, all sorts of uh, businesses were booming and uh, new jobs were being created. And Fort Worth grew as a result of that. Uh, in 1922, we'll talk a little bit more about this, the city began to see that it wanted to annex other areas and it began to grow land-wise. In uh, November of 1923, the heirs of Charles Daggett uh, and Mary A. Daggett sold about 312 acres out of the original Daggett survey to the Riverside Realty Company. As I mentioned, Fort Worth doubled in size in 1922 by annexation. And these are all the areas that were annexed at that time, many of them familiar to you. Riverside was one of them. And that started what really uh, began to be the development of the Oakhurst neighborhood. Just the fact that uh, 1922 was, was the era when Riverside became a part of Fort Worth. And John P. King, as I mentioned before, was uh, the one seeing that that happened. When I said that he was a major real estate developer, uh, I really meant that. He uh, not only uh, developed Oakhurst, but uh, four years after Oakhurst, he started working on Monticello over on the west side. He built businesses. He was a civic leader and he was responsible for bringing the council manager form of government to Fort Worth. He left notable architecture in these neighborhoods that he developed, as well as his own uh, home on Crestline, designed by uh, the well-known Texas architect, John Staub. And he was always uh, immensely respected by everybody from Eamon Carter to those who worked for him. This is always the story that you read about John King when you do research about him. If you know anything about King's chocolates from all those many years ago, you remember uh, Christmas ads for King Candy for American Queens is the way they style themselves. This building uh, was the where the factory was, the King Candy Company on East Ninth Street in downtown Fort Worth. Um, and so many people remember that. One of the times I gave this talk, somebody came up to me after the talk and had an actual a candy box, a King Candy box he's saved for 40 or 50 years. And so that was a relic of, of, those, of those times. Uh, in 1924, in April, uh, the Riverside Realty Company uh, had major stockholders, and one of them was John P. King. And um, he and others, uh, major stockholders, decided in that year, in that month of 1924, to change the name of the Riverside Realty Company to the Oakhurst Land Company. And that's when they filed their first plat for Oakhurst and for the development of the neighborhood. You know, in the 20s, with all this growth going on, the population was rising. We were getting all these suburb, uh, suburban areas that were being annexed to the city. And so there was naturally a lot of architectural development. Carol Roark is one of our great writers about Fort Worth history. And in her book, uh, she wrote about how it became uh, the fashion for revival architecture to be uh, 
built, uh, designed for, and built in neighborhoods. This is an example of a 1929 Tudor style house in Oakhurst. And this is the kind of architecture you were beginning to see in this list of all these neighborhoods over here that had been annexed into the city of Fort Worth and were beginning to grow. This is an original plat from the 1924 Oakhurst Land Company brochure. It really was a vision. Over here were the first eight blocks that became the first plat uh, where the first houses were developed. And this part uh, that was drawn for everybody to see was the vision of where they hoped the neighborhood would expand. And so they started with the first eight blocks and a vision, and it wasn't long until 1925, the uh, plat you see on the left, in 1926, the plat on the right, these are the actual plats from the city that, that began to happen. They moved quickly, John P. King and his fellow Oakhurst Land Company developers to make sure that the land was platted that, that would be available for people to buy or to build uh, houses uh, as they wanted to. They did lots of advertising. I have been at the library many times uh, working uh, in Linda's department, looking uh, for uh, city directories and all kinds of uh, examples of the ads that were done very early for the Oakhurst development. Uh, Henry King, who was the agent, was a brother of John P. King, and so he was in the business. This was an example of a, one of the early houses that you could buy in Oakhurst. And we look today with wonder at uh, the, the price of the lots, you know, $775 or to all the way to $975. But you could get a lot and, and look at what they were advertising. Paved all the way. That was a, a big amenity. Eight minutes from Main Street. That was the headline attraction. Why somebody might want to move to this middle class neighborhood of Oakhurst where everything grows in Riverside, which was a veritable horticultural wonderland. Uh, all kinds of fruit trees and flowers and everything grew. And this was something that they also um, advertised as a, a real benefit to Oakhurst. They were from the very beginning when they were uh, advertising Oakhurst. This is a little map that came out of one of the early uh, marketing brochures. It gives you the exact route on how to get from uh, downtown, which was here, all the way to Oakhurst. And they even spelled out the name of the neighborhood for you in a little small copy of the plat. What you see here under community planning and development is the description of why the Oakhurst neighborhood was eligible to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places, why it was considered significant. It was a suburban middle-class neighborhood whose development between 1924 and 1959 coincided with Fort Worth's growth as a regional industrial and transportation hub in North Texas. As I mentioned, uh, they really touted the fact that everything grows in Oakhurst and so plum trees and vegetable gardens uh, and giving you lots that were 60 by 180 feet, which were sort of unusually large lots with these houses really caused people to be able to grow all kinds of flowers and vegetable gardens and all those sorts of things. These are early images of the Oakhurst neighborhood at the ceremonial entrance at Daisy Lane in the very beginning before there were plants uh, that people had put maybe in the median here. But these are the iconic columns that you saw at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, we had several sets, one here at Daisy Lane, which entered into the middle of the neighborhood, but that was that's the historic entrance from 1924. We also had columns at uh, Sylvania and Yucca and also at Sylvania and Watauga Road farther north. They gave you examples of the various houses that were going to be available in the brochures that they put out. And some of them were brick, some of them were frame, and some of them were brick. But a lot of people who had been living on the north side in frame houses decided, well, you know, maybe it's time to move on up to the east side uh, and uh, we can get a brick house of our very own. I put this slide in to show you this is Daisy Lane again, you've seen that, but this is the water tower that was in the neighborhood for some time. There was an artesian well in the early days of the neighborhood which supplied the neighborhood with water and this was where they stored it. And that's always a fascinating thing to find those early photographs. 
This is one that I love to show. This is North Sylvania Avenue and you're looking north. Uh, Oakhurst is on your left and here are the columns. And so just imagine you're going north uh, on an unpaved Sylvania Avenue at that point. This is particularly fascinating because this structure here is an early sales office. That's where you might have gone to, uh, you know, sit down with uh, Henry King, maybe, or another agent and uh, talk about buying a, a lot and uh, having a house in Oakhurst. As I mentioned, uh, homes were frame or brick, large lots. You see here how that was certainly true on this property. The, they also had a variety of housing styles. Now, these are rather small, but these were uh, examples of the very cozy uh, Tudor style that we had, bungalows. Uh, the, the kind of housing that was built in the 1920s was very prominent in Oakhurst. And here again is uh, that house closest to the water tower on Daisy Lane. I love that picture. Um, so John King and his wife, Lorena Blair King, had three sons. And as you can imagine, John uh, was, was not a young man when he began to develop Oakhurst, um, but he had wanted, it's always been said that it was his desire that his sons would follow him into the candy business, into the King Candy business. And so two of them did, but there was a baby son and uh, he did not. He was uh, educated at the University of Texas and later Princeton. And he was an artist and his name was Clinton Blair King. Uh, Clinton found himself in early uh, Paris in the 1920s where Ernest Hemingway and uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and other literary notables we could name were out and about and Clinton knew them. And uh, he met as a result of knowing um, uh, Duff Twisden and knowing Hemingway, he got to meet her and fell in love with this British socialite uh, and uh, they married, uh, much to the chagrin of his parents. Uh, here is Duff Twisden next to Ernest Hemingway. And Hemingway was so taken with Lady Duff Twisden that he named in his first novel, The Sun Also Rises, the character he fashioned, the character of Brett Ashley in this book after Duff Twisden. And so uh, that may seem far afield from Oakhurst, but it's an interesting part of what was going on in the world at that time. And we uh, in Oakhurst, because of John King, have a connection to that. So that's what was happening with Clinton in the 1920s. We may revisit him later. Um, Basically, as Oakhurst and the development of it went along uh, in the 30s, we, we began to get into the Depression. There were still houses being built. This is a plat of 1931 and what was going on uh, in those uh, days. But also you should know that there was a well-known uh, golf course and club where Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson played as young men. This, this was the, known as the Oakhurst uh, Golf course and club, and it was just west across Oakhurst Scenic Drive from the neighborhood for several years in the 1930s, but that's a claim to fame that the neighborhood has had all those years. Um, here's an aerial view from 1939. Uh, you can see that there is much development here going on, but here, this curving street is blue bonnet, there is just Daggett's Woods still over here, not really growth and development yet, although there were plans. Uh, hair and hair landscape architects were engaged by Mr. King to uh, develop West Oakhurst, a separate, as I mentioned before, addition in the neighborhood. And so Hare and Hare, who were from Kansas City, um, laid out these plans. You can see it was a very wooded area, but they laid out the streets and uh, soon there would be platting going along with it at the city level. It was designed to take advantage of all the clusters of trees and the curvilinear streets and to provide a new area for there to be housing development. Um, what happened was the war. And so that stopped some of the development. We'll talk about that in a minute. In the meantime, in the early 1940s, Clinton King, uh, who by that time had lost his wife, Duff Twisden, she had died in Santa Fe. He was an artist, of course, and that's where they had lived. 
while in Santa Fe, Clinton King met Georgia O'Keeffe and the famous painter and Georgia O'Keeffe and Mabel Don Lujan, Dodge Luhan introduced him to Narcissa Swift and here they are, they got together. They were married in 1941. Narcissa Swift was an heiress of Chicago. Her grandfather was Gustavus Swift of Swift and Company Meat Packers. He had actually invented the refrigerated train car for transporting meat. And anybody who knows Fort Worth and knows the Fort Worth Stockyards knows uh, Swift and Company. Uh, and of course this was Gustavus Swift's company. So here we had this tremendous connection between uh, Clinton and his new wife, Narcissa Swift. Uh, and these are just a couple of examples of Clinton's artwork uh, and what he, he was a noted regionalist and his, his paintings were displayed throughout um, the country. Um, so this is just a very interesting, he had very interesting wives both times and uh, they led him to be uh, famous himself. Um, I mentioned that John King was sort of the Eamon Carter before there was Eamon Carter. This is showing you the older man with, with the, the younger man. Uh, this was a surprise birthday party that Eamon Carter threw for Mr. King when he turned 80 years old in 1941. Uh, just an example of how sort of the power brokers uh, in Fort Worth were uh, getting to know each other and uh, celebrating in times like that. I mentioned West Oakhurst, you saw the hair and hair plan for it. Well, these are the two plats that began to establish it. In February, 1946, it was after the war was over that they actually began to plat uh, uh, both in February, 1946 on the left and August, 1946 on the right. And um, that's when it became real and people began to buy those lots and to build those ranch style houses. Here is a 1949 aerial of, uh, Oakhurst, and you can see Oakhurst Scenic Drive on the right, and Mount Olivet is here on the very bottom, one of our defensible edges that will always be there and is a great protector, frankly, for the neighborhood. Uh, but you can see that there's much more development going on here uh, after all of this platting work went on in 1946. So who did live in Oakhurst? Um, well, it appealed to the average man as our historian who wrote our National Register nomination, Susan Klein wrote, but also professionals. So we've always had a mix of the kinds of people who have lived here. And I think that's a great strength of the neighborhood. It means we have different sizes of houses. The average size house in Oakhurst is about 1100 square feet, but we have much larger houses than that. And even some, a few that are smaller, uh, but it makes for a, a great socioeconomic mix uh, we have, you know, families, young families, we have retired couples, we have single people, we have all sorts of people, and they all really come together to create the strength of the neighborhood. There were famous people, uh, or maybe well-known, I should say, people who were related to famous people who lived in Oakhurst. People like uh, Lucia Johnson Alexander, she's here in the middle next to her brother, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who at the time that Lucia and her husband, Burge, who was director of the FAA, not too far from here at Meacham Field, the time that they lived in, in Oakhurst, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson was what they call, what Robert Carroll has written about him. He was the master of the Senate. He was the majority leader of the United States Senate in the 1950s, and that's when they lived here. That's an interesting thing most people don't know. Uh, but we had also people like William Barney, who uh, later in his life became poet laureate of Texas. He did, when he was a younger person, live in Oakhurst, and so we claim him. Another connection to literary history there. Johnny Simons, if you know Hip Pocket Theater in Fort Worth, uh, you know that he founded that and has been the longtime director. He, he grew up in Oakhurst and so we claim him. Uh, John Thomas Lennox is a much less well-known. This is John right in the middle. This is a photograph out of an Amon Carter Riverside High School yearbook when he was a student there. Uh, but, but John Thomas Lennox was well-known in Hollywood and he was the producer of Tom Hanks's film, his first film, Splash, and so that's one reason we remember John Thomas, who sadly died on his birthday at the age of 50. Uh, Smokey Montgomery, for music lovers, the people who remember the Light Crest Doughboys, Smokey Montgomery lived in Oakhurst for a time. Uh, here he is with Gene Autry at the Burris Mills studio uh, during those days, and that's also a fun thing to know about Oakhurst. 
there were lots of children, as you can imagine, who lived in Oakhurst. And the photo on my left is one of my very favorites because these are Oakhurst children who had been taken down there by one or more of their uh, caregivers. Uh, this was Daggett's Woods. This was in the 1930s before we had houses in West Oakhurst. But they were actually uh, able to build their own little uh, campfire and roast marshmallows over it. They did that sort of thing in those days. And they also uh, were able to bring a pony into the neighborhood and ride around for a little bit with a friend. So these were uh, days long ago, but uh, they are great memories of those who were there and those who share these photographs. All the memories came back. What about the architecture of Oakhurst? What's it like? Well, it's um, a, a mix. As you see here, we have, this is listed in, in uh, the order of the, the styles uh, show up in our neighborhood. Tudor style, ranch style, minimal traditional, bungalows, and colonial revival. So we have the most number, about 22% of the houses in Elkhurst are Tudor style. Um, this is a quite a grand example and sort of an exaggerated one. This uh, is a house on Marigold that uh, actually now is a City of Fort Worth historic landmark, was built in 1936, but gives you an example of, as does this one, much smaller. Remember I said we have large houses and we have small houses. But we also have a uh, sort of medium size like this Tudor style over uh, on Blue Bonnet or this one facing on Sylvania or this one, which is sort of medium size. You'll find these all throughout the neighborhood and they are quite wonderful and spectacular. We even have a couple of frame Tudors, which are exceedingly rare, but they do exist and we have some of them. Um, we have those who just love these houses and buy them and want to maintain the architectural integrity of them and are doing quite a good job of that today. We also have examples of, of various styles of houses. This one happens to be a Tudor uh, that were constructed of stone. And a lot of times you will find these houses were uh, made of stone that came from Palo Pinto County west of here. So that's an interesting fact to, to know about. Ranch style houses are the next uh, largest group of, of uh, housing styles that we have. And these are basically found in West Oakhurst and along Blue Bonnet. So here are a couple of examples. Here's another City of Fort Worth historic landmark individually designated, which is over on the uh, West Lotus cul-de-sac. And it's a lovely example. This one's over on Oakhurst Scenic Drive. Others throughout West Oakhurst are quite um, spacious and uh, stately, I think. They're, they're quite wonderful. And the trees, of course, are always a, a great um, addition to these lots where these houses are built. Bungalows are popular in Oakhurst. Um, they come in smaller ones like this. They come in examples like this, where you have brick style, uh, craftsman style, very popular among those who are looking to move into the neighborhood. Some think this is the best uh, bungalow in Oakhurst, uh, architecturally speaking, in terms of an architectural integrity standpoint. Uh, and then, you know, they get dressed up uh, uh, when we have holidays, like the 4th of July and that sort of thing. But again, here's one on Marigold that's uh, quite lovely. Colonial Revival style is a popular style also in the neighborhood, and we have a lot of examples of it. Um, as you see, again, they're just all sorts of sizes. This is an example of, you know, I mentioned that we had a lot of folks from the north side who came over and uh, decided they wanted to build and live in uh, Oakhurst. And here's an example. This one was built by J.E. Cavender, who, who was a foreman at Swift and Company. It was very uh, common to find um, that, you know, you had a lot of people working at various uh, places like that, foreman or Swift and Company meatpacking jobs, all kinds of things. We had secretaries who were working in those businesses over there in the heyday of the stockyards. Many of them lived here. I would suspect that Mr. Cavender was related to the Cavender uh, stores that we used to advertise, the uh, Western wear stores. Minimal traditional houses are often found in Oakhurst and um, this is a large example, quite beautiful, quite a large lot size. 
this actually is on Wisteria Court, and this house um, is now, uh, uh, it's a wildlife sanctuary, so designated by uh, one of the wildlife organizations, but these folks that own it decided they really wanted to, to go for that. So that's kind of a fun thing to have in the neighborhood, a little bit of a wildlife sanctuary. Um, more small, minimal, traditional houses. I love this one because of the snow. Um, just another, another example of uh, what's available in housing stock. We also have um, some very special examples. This is what we call the Alamo House in Oakhurst, and that is uh, mission style. Uh, built in 1930, a much loved house, uh, quite beautiful, and uh, it's just unique. There's nothing like it in the neighborhood. I should say that there are no two houses alike exactly uh, in Oakhurst. We do have a couple that are mirror images of one another, but they're not exactly alike. Um, and then this, this is actually a historic photo of a house uh, on Sylvania Avenue. It's actually just been purchased by somebody who really has a desire to restore it. It's built in 1927 mission style. And at the time it was built, it was called the most pretentious house in Oakhurst. Uh, so that is, uh, that will be fun to watch uh, as that one comes forward. Well, Oakhurst is a special place, not just for its history and not just for its architecture, but I've always said it has great bones. It was an intentional plan. Uh, they laid it out uh, with such care uh, and gave us uh, real amenities in the design and plan of the neighborhood uh, that it just makes us feel like home because we've, we've grown to, to love and understand. Uh, and I, I always try to point these things out. They're important for why the neighborhood has its character. One of them is setbacks. We have a, a uniform setback. It's larger, it's longer, it's about 35 feet, uh, more so than the standard city setback. That's why it's important to hang on to uh, those kinds of things. If somebody came in tomorrow and decided they were going to take a house down and build another one and build it out right about here, this would destroy uh, the setback, uh, the lovely view that you have up and down the street. It's, it's a reason why we're not necessarily born with design sense, but we need to learn what makes up, what are the elements of good design so that we know when we need to hang on to those to keep the sense of place that we have. Another thing you will find often in Oakhurst are um, low stone walls. Uh, these are prevalent all around the neighborhood, and they do give us a little bit of a sense of place and hanging on to uh, when the neighborhood was new. We're lucky that Oakhurst has so much green space. It's like living in green space because of all the trees, but we have a park right in the middle of the neighborhood. Mr. King donated that land to uh, the city in the 40s so that it would become officially Oakhurst Park uh, at one time during the war the park was where there actually was a Red Cross station and uh, they were taking donations and, you know, probably rolling bandages and doing all those sorts of things. But it, the park is a, is a great uh, people place. It's where we gather for neighborhood uh, activities, uh, for, you know, Easter egg hunts or meeting Santa or seeing the Easter bunny, that sort of thing. But a lot of kids just come up as they always have, come up to the park to play. And uh, it's great to have it so close. The columns are nothing if not iconic. They are a place-making feature. Uh, we had them restored at the same time that we uh, worked on uh, the National Register nomination. We uh, had some funds come to the Neighborhood Association that enabled us to actually hire local artist, Alice Bateman, who was able to repair uh, some work that needed to be done on uh, the columns. And so they have been uh, restored, we hope, for many future generations. This just shows you a viewpoint. If you're looking again, straight up North Sylvania that we looked at earlier when it was unpaved, here it's paved and here's one set of columns you're looking at and you're standing in the Daisy Lane common area right there. This is a view from across the street. So you can see how you can enter into the ceremonial entrance and you've got the columns here and the columns here. 
curving streets are just part of what hair and hair designed uh, along with the trees. We have uh, historic uh, curb tiles, which are wonderful. Uh, we have even insisted to the city that where they, where they must tuck those out, sometimes that has to happen when they're repairing a street, we want them to put them back and they do. Uh, and so, but we have to stay on it uh, to keep it around. Common areas are another important factor and, and really an amenity we have in Oakhurst. And um, this is uh, Daisy Lane once again, but we plant flowers here and you're looking uh, west down the street. Uh, and it's just an, a nice thing to have a little bit of space and a little bit of shade. People often stop there. Here are a couple of other examples. We have more common areas in this one, but these are the two major ones. This is Marigold on the left. So it's nice little green space there. There's a bench there. If you're out running or walking, you could stop there and, and sit for a moment if you wanted to. And on the right is the common area in uh, on West Lotus. It's actually in their little cul-de-sac there. There's now, and you may be able to see it, there's what we call the Walk of Honor here. And there's stones laid out. People are nominated for this who've been longtime contributors to the neighborhood and their names are placed here. So that's become another place-making feature, which we like a lot. How about great entrance streets? Uh, this is a wonderful thing. This is Yucca Avenue, which is a major entrance into the neighborhood. And you can see that we have just a, a, a nice row of uh, Tudor style houses here, which again, add to the character of the neighborhood and uh, are just, you just know that you've arrived. You're someplace. Uh, it feels like this is not a slapdash place. It feels like someplace that was carefully laid out. This is uh, the major entrance uh, blue bonnet. If you come up the hill on Yucca and you turn uh, left into the neighborhood, this is uh, Blue Bonnet Street. And this will take you all the way through West Oak Hurst is over here. The original part of the neighborhood is over here. And as I remember, I said about two thirds of it of Oak Hurst is, is over here, sort of the straight platted streets over here, and then West Oakhurst, the later edition, is, is here and beyond here. Hair and Hair, I mentioned them. Anybody who knows about the Fort Worth Botanic Garden has probably heard the name of Herbert Hare. Well, his father was Sid Hare, and uh, of course, as I mentioned, they were from Kansas City, but uh, Sidney Hare, because of his association with um, George Kessler, who had worked for the city of Dallas and ultimately for the city of Fort Worth, he got very interested in design and, and uh, became a cemetery designer. And uh, he was responsible, the father, Sidney Hare, for designing Mount Olivet in 1907. And it is nothing if not a beautiful, beautiful cemetery. And we are so lucky to have it close to us generations of Oakhurstians have walked up to that cemetery on a daily basis for daily exercise. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I know who learned to drive in this cemetery. Uh, you know, it was close and mom or dad would take them up and they would just, you know, kind of creep through those, those uh, narrow uh, lanes there in the cemetery and that's how they learned to drive. And so that's a, that's a placemaker for you. That, that's a memory maker for you. So Sid Hare did that for us, but uh, Herbert Hare became actually ultimately uh, in Fort Worth the more prolific designer because he was one of the first graduates of uh, Harvard's uh, landscape uh, architecture program, one of the six first ones they had. And so his whole career was spent in landscape architecture and projects all over the country. Fort Worth, over the years, hired him to do 60 and more projects, the most important of which is his Botanic Gardens from 1936. Oakhurst was lucky to have him during the era of the Depression, 1936-1937, when federal funds were available to construct Oakhurst Scenic Drive. And this is a historic photo of it right here um, you see there were even cars parked along. Uh, today, 
uh, we know that it was meant to be a scenic drive. It was often uh, in the early part of, the, of the, I'd say the first 30, 40 years, it was maintained as a park road by the city of Fort Worth and was even considered on the uh, city park uh, as we found and discovered on uh, maps uh, at the park department that Oak Ridge Scenic Drive was actually considered a park. This is what it looks like today. This is actually uh, the northernmost section. It's about uh, two miles long if when you first turn off Oakhurst Scenic Drive from Belknap Street. But this is up toward the Oakhurst part and it's it's sort of uh, feels almost like a park road. It's it's lovely. There's some slow stone features that that come from the era of when it was built uh, in the uh, Depression year era. And so it's nice to be able to hang on to those. This I'd give you as a point of comparison. This is a hair and hair designed uh, five mile road in Tacoma, Washington at Point Defiance Park. It's a hair and hair design, the curving road, all the trees. And then I'll give you the comparison. So here's Oakhurst Scenic Drive. Here's Point Defiance Park. Can you tell it's the same designer who designed them both? It's not hard to imagine that it was. And it's Oakhurst Scenic Drive is a tremendous jewel. Um, what about saving the neighborhood? We've talked about history and the history is the foundation of what started the physical part, which is the structures, the plan, the park, all the things we looked at and the elements, they all complement one another. I'm a preservationist. I've written a little history. I would never claim to be uh, a historian uh, in terms of, you know, that's all I spend my time on. But I really believe that in order to save a neighborhood or a great place, you need to do some of both. You need to understand the history and be able to tell the stories because often those attract people and support for your project before the architecture may. Um, sometimes it's a little harder for people to understand. And well, what is it? We why is it important to save this house or those houses or that block? Once they begin to know the stories and begin to understand the architecture and the design and why they are significant, uh, then then you will find that there is a much greater appreciation of why saving this history needs to happen. So the National Register of Historic Places, uh, what is it? Well, it's the official list of the nation's historic places worthy of preservation. It was part of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which was brought to us uh, during LBJ's presidency. And it's the National Park Service, which maintains the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, and it really puts together a program to coordinate support public and private efforts to identify, evaluate and protect America's historic and archeological resources. Um, there are about 95,000 properties listed in the National Register that was as of about 2019. So that's about 1.8 million contributing resources. Tarrant County, a little closer to home, there are 23 National Register Historic Districts. Most of them are in Fort Worth commercial districts. Uh, the availability of the historic rehab tax credits has made them very popular. That's why we seem to have a lot of commercial historic districts. People wanted those tax credits to redo those commercial buildings. But there are about 89 individually listed properties. And if we have four National Register neighborhoods, Elizabeth Boulevard, Fairmount, Southside, Grand Avenue, and Oakhurst. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the largest in Tarrant County in the last 30 years. Benefits include uh, eligibility for federal tax credits, which I mentioned. If you, and, and that's a benefit to, to Oakhurst and any National Register neighborhood, if you own income producing property in the neighborhood and you want to uh, revitalize, renovate, rehabilitate the property, you would be eligible for federal uh, preservation tax credits for a contributing structure. That's something that there's a lot to say about, but that's at this point point. That's something that people need to know and take advantage of. It also provides uh, review and potential mitigation for adverse impacts on such properties caused by federally funded projects like highways. Um, and that's where we come to Oakhurst because 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, when we started, um, you know, we, we were talking about a national register district. We were talking about, hey, wouldn't we like to have a local historic district? But we knew that, and this is Interstate 35 right here. 
and this is Oakhurst right here. <laughs> we knew that, that Interstate 35 was going to be expanded, and we knew there were going to be impacts, noise impacts, and perhaps site impacts, and various things that we thought, you know, we want a seat at the table so that we were able to protect the neighborhood. And so we need to be a National Register designated and listed neighborhood in order to have that seat at the table, which because we got the listing, we were at the table and we were able to work on mitigation with the uh, director of the uh, TxDOT division office here in Fort Worth on all those. And it wasn't just for a year. This went on for like 10 years while the the whole project to expand I-35 was being planned. So that's what it took, uh, why we decided to pursue National Register listing. We were lucky uh, before 2010, when we were beginning to have all the oil and gas and the um, drilling boom here in Fort Worth, Dale Resources was a drilling company that, that um, presented a $25,000 grant to our neighborhood association for capital improvement projects. And so I mentioned that we uh, spent some money on restoring a columns. We spent money restoring common areas and we spent some of that money on um, designating uh, and hiring uh, Susan Klein to help us write what really was an $18,000 nomination. Uh, you know, they're not cheap. It's, it's, it's really, it's professional work. You have to have somebody who knows what they're doing, do one. But we hired her for that. We got a small grant from the National Trust to put with that. And we just made up the rest of it in uh, volunteer hours in all the research that was done to collect the data and the research because we had to research over 700 houses in the neighborhood. Um, you had to have, we, we'd had to have an agreement of the neighborhood at a public meeting. And we spent about a year working with staff at the Texas Historical Commission in Austin um, on the nomination, on the documentation, uh, photo documentation. And then Susan made the formal presentation to the actual commission. And we were, it was approved in uh, late 2009 and the uh, Park Service actually listed us in for, uh, February of 2010. So that was our national register process. Um, I'll talk a little bit in just a minute about local historic districts. Before I do that, I wanna just mention, uh, you know, there's a lot more. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing to make a decision. Okay, we're gonna go for a national register district, or we're going to go for a local historic district. You know, we have a few neighborhoods that are both here in Fort Worth, and that's that's the best. That's where you want to be. But what are the things that you need to be always thinking about and working on because you're always in the business of trying to save the neighborhood? Well, to my way of thinking, it has a lot to do with building awareness and working with uh the people in your neighborhood. These are just examples of what we've done at the Neighborhood Association. This is Brent Hull, whom you probably know of Hull Historical. We've had him come and speak. We've had architects put on workshops, you know, kind of this old house, come ask your question on a Saturday morning about how to fix a certain element of your house, that sort of thing. Neighborhood meetings where we might have a panel like we did here of residents, young and older, who came and told stories about what it was like to grow up in Oakhurst. Everything about sort of keeping top of mind uh, what it is about this neighborhood that we love and why it is so important. But it is true that the price of preservation is eternal vigilance. You can't quit. You're never finished. Uh, you have goals, you reach those goals, and you keep going. Constant education is just part of the deal, as I mentioned before. You need workshops. Uh, you need, like I did, write a book, you know, uh, have something that you can always give to realtors, for example, or new residents who don't know the history and you want them to know the history. Neighborhood newsletter articles. I spent 12 and a half years of my life as the editor of our neighborhood monthly newsletter, and I wrote a, a historical article on some facet, people or structures or something, every month for those 12 years um, so that people wouldn't forget what was going on and, and what we had to save and what we had to preserve and why it was valuable. We had talks, we had presentations, uh, workshops, like I had mentioned. Here are a couple of examples of the newsletter. When, when we were listed in the National Register, we, we touted that. Stories we told about people who lived in the neighborhood who had links to Fort Worth history. 
Uh, you just you work it from every angle that you can. And when it comes to the physical part of it, uh, relationships with the decision makers are absolutely key. So you have to get to know your city council member. Uh, you want to get to know your members who represent your district on the zoning commission or the board of adjustment, the landmark commission, make them your advocates. And that's true also for state representatives and state senators. It's all about knowing them. They know you. They know what the, the neighborhood is about and, and what the neighborhood wants to be now and in the future. At the same time you're doing that, you're building awareness among your residents, old and new. And uh, also, if you have something like a National Register District, it's a good idea to also look into the possibility of becoming a local historic district. And if that doesn't seem like that's going to pan out, you can certainly designate individual structures. If you think about it, and they tell us this all the time, our local members of our city councils are the most important to us because they are working on things that are closest to us. It's the local historic designation that is the most protective. It's the one that's going to save a house from being torn down. Um, and so we have now, I, I took it upon myself to, you know, if we have to designate the neighborhood one house at a time, well, then that's what we're going to do. So I've written uh, more than, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 of these local nominations. A few others of our neighbors have done their own, but we have now almost 20 locally designated landmarks. And that is the, the direction that we are continuing to go. You can't say enough about the importance of recognition signs and plaques and probably, hopefully, uh, before Oak Coast turns 100 in 2024, we will have our plaque. All right, before I talk more about local historic districts, let me just give you a few more images. So you saw that earlier map, which showed how you got from downtown to Oakhurst uh, before we had the Belknap Street Bridge in the 30s. This was constructed in the 30s. So this is a view of Riverside Park right here. This is the Trinity River, obviously that's downtown, and this is the Belknap Street Bridge. And you follow this, this bridge all the way out of downtown, you don't even have to get on the freeway, you can come here and you can turn on to Oakhurst. Well, for the 35 years I've lived here, you, you turn and, and people would say, you know, I breathe a sigh of relief. I see all the green space, I see all the trees, and it's just like, wow, I'm out of, the, I'm out of downtown, I'm, I'm going home and I'm breathing again. Here's the river again. This is Oakhurst Senior Drive over here. This is the river right here. Well, today, when you turn onto Oakhurst Scenic Drive, we have apartments and they are there and they, they, they continue farther up the street. So, so the loss of green space is, is happening along Oakhurst Scenic Drive. There are not 2000 apartments along Oakhurst Scenic Drive, but there are, I would say within about a half a mile to three quarters of a mile of this location right here of, of the neighborhood. So that just indicates to you there's been a lot of change that's been going on in our area for the last six, seven years. This can happen. It did happen. Um, and we were told by folks we know in the neighborhood who uh, market um, realty, uh, real estate, uh, apartment uh, complexes, this clearing of Oakhurst Scenic Drive, partially city-owned property, because the, the scenic drive, the, the city-owned property continues up probably a ways up here. Now, up this way was private property. But the clearing happened because they wanted to be sure that folks can see that there are apartments up here to be leased. <laughs> so that happened about four years ago. In fairness, it's a lot of it's grown back. This was taken, these were taken oh, about a week ago. So, you know, it could stand some, um, I'd say some trimming and, you know, making it look better. But we're kind of seeing a little bit of a proliferation of signs. It's, it's not as wild and green as it was. It is becoming much more urbanized. Um, in Oakhurst, yes, and, and I could have, but I didn't think I really had time or space. We do have new houses that are built, you know, it's not unusual, there might be a vacant lot, so somebody will build something. Luckily, for the most part, we've been pretty lucky. Folks are not building replicas when they're building houses in Oakhurst, they're building contemporary but compatible, that's great. This, however, is a contemporary, a, a current example of one being, it faces Sylvania, which is over here. 
And it's an example of what not to build. This is why we would want there to be a local historic district, because if there had been, in order to get the building permit, they would have had to have a permit for the new construction, which would have required, okay, you're gonna have to have a scale that works with this house. You're not gonna you know, get to build necessarily between two one-story houses. We're gonna want you to not have a, a front entrance garage, you know, let's let's work with the characteristics of Oakhurst. That would be the purpose of the uh, review for uh, a new house. But here we are, you know, when you have to depend on the kindness of strangers, this is what you get. So there we are with that. Um, we're starting to see a few things in the neighborhood proper, like fences in front yards. Well, you can have them, but, you know, a local historic district, you could have a guideline that said, well, we're not going to have fences and front yards, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so that's an example of, it's sort of creep, you know, it, it can happen uh, if you're not careful with what's going on. Very quickly, I wanted to just make you aware of this, because this is, this is where there's an intersection between history, preservation, the way we live now, the quality of life we have in our neighborhoods, and what's going on in Austin. Right now in the Texas legislative session, uh, there is, well, there are many bills as you can imagine, but House Bill 1474 uh, directly affects uh, the designation of local historic districts. So think about a, a, an area like Elizabeth Boulevard uh, here in Fort Worth, it's a local historic district. If it weren't and they were trying to get it or just as Oakhurst, if somebody who owned a property over there objected uh, and they couldn't get a super majority of the number of council members to agree to it, then that owner can opt out of the local historic district. For those who appreciate the importance of local historic districts and their ability to save the character and to uh, require that new construction you know, work with the neighborhood, this is not good news because opting out uh, means that What's the point if you don't have to, if you can just you know, drop out of it and anything can happen to that property, it's not within the district. You're not really accomplishing anything uh, by having a district. So probably this is going to pass. It's already passed the Senate. It probably means we're all going to have to be doing a whole lot more work to find those who want to designate their homes individually and designate them. So that's the reality of what's going on right now as we speak. Uh, that will be voted on before May 31st. So where that leaves us is this. Saving history is important work and we should never give up. One of my favorite speeches of all time is Winston Churchill's from the House of Commons in June of 1940 as the British people faced the scourge of Nazism, and he told them that they would defend their island nation. We shall never surrender. I feel that way about our local history. We shall never surrender. It's too important. Too many people love it. Too many people enjoy the benefits of all of the amenities of living in a historic neighborhood. They love the connection to the past, but they're looking, preservationists are the most forward people, looking people I know, because what they wanna do is bring the history into the future so that their children and grandchildren and neighbors can enjoy it in the future. That's what it's about. It's not about pickling the past, it's about saving the history for the future. Um, and I will leave you with this. This is the quotation at the flagpole in Oakhurst, and it's from Abraham Lincoln. I like to see a man proud of the place where he lives. I like to see a man live so that his place will be proud of him. So that's what we think about in Oakhurst, and that's what we're working on every day. And we are never giving up. And that's where we are. And I'm sorry you had to look at it with all these titles because we couldn't do full screen, but that is yours, How to Save a Great Neighborhood in an Hour during National Historic Preservation Week. Thank you, Libby.
Uh, at this point, we are going to take a look at some of our questions. I know we have a few. See, first of all, uh, if folks are, are just commenting that they're really enjoying the program uh, and admired the advocacy that you've done over the years. Um, one question is, how is Oakhurst saving the homes that are not designated historic from demo and new build? Um, you know, <laughs> we're sort of back to education, education, education. As I mentioned, uh, I have written, of course it didn't happen during the pandemic year last year, but before that we were at a pretty good clip of writing individual nominations and getting those approved at the Landmark Commission and by the City Council. So that's a strategy. But more than that, you know, when you don't have an entire district and you have 700 houses, it's all about providing education and um, here's a better way to do things, that sort of thing. Um, so we, we're, sort of, we're sort of back to our whole building awareness phase, basically, is where we are with that. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, uh, one of our attendees uh, said that you interviewed her mom, uh, Mrs. Locktrog, yes. about the Albrecht family home in Oakhurst, and that she, um, she appreciated the fact that by virtue of you doing the interview about Oakhurst, it preserved some of her family history in the process. Excellent. So that, that is a, and that's an added bonus of this whole uh, type of project. Absolutely, absolutely. That was a great day. That was a wonderful interview. She's a wonderful lady, and uh, as were her daughters. And we had a great time doing that. That's so much fun, you know. That's like living history and, and oral history interviews, and uh, really love that. And we need to do a lot more. I'll tell you quickly one thing. Uh, you know, uh, several years ago, five, seven years ago, it dawned on me. I was still editing the newsletter. We kept, we were beginning to lose our World War II residents, right? And many of them had fought it in many different places during the war. But every time we passed the anniversary of D-Day in June, I would think to myself, we've got to get out there and interview these people because it's sad. You know, I want to hear their real life stories. I don't want to just be hearing about, oh my gosh, we've lost them. So that to me was a real impetus for let's go get those interviews. Let's hear those stories and, and record them. That's what history is about. And so uh, that's been a personal mission of mine to try to do that, get some more. Libby, we have another comment. Uh, someone says that their great grandfather, Raymond Walker Jr., who was age 24 at the time, and his young wife, Doris Walker, built a cute two-story tutor at the corner of Blue Bonnet and Goldenrod in 1939. Awesome. Any pictures? <laughs> he, he says that he worked for Swifts and moved around the country, including Chicago, Columbus, and Nashville, before returning to Fort Worth and building a house on their family's ranch. Fantastic. I would love to see... Uh... Would like to learn more about, about about them and about that. Please get in touch. <laughs> we're always adding. We're always adding information constantly. To what I was about to to comment about how the process, the research process, never stops. You never may stops. Uh, you may acquire enough to reach your designation uh, and inform that process, but there's always something more to learn uh, about a, a district like that. That's true. And, and I just in writing about the book, I gathered, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of information and a lot of historic photographs. But interestingly, once the book came out, there was even more that came in. You know, we thought we'd cover the waterfront, but a lot more came in. So you're right, Leanna. And there's well, and we another. Have... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Linda. There's another daughter of an interviewee. Uh, the interviewee was Anna Beth Robinson. And her daughter said that she has just returned to her childhood home in Oakhurst and wanted to thank you for educating the neighborhood and the city. And she said that it was very meaningful to her that you did that interview with her mom. Yeah, her mom was a wonderful lady. And I'm so glad that, uh, that she's that her daughter is back. I knew she was coming. I didn't know she was here. That's terrific. That's great. 
the families, you know, the, many families in Elkhurst, uh, they just they just stay and, and generations. Uh, this is an example. It's great. I did not live in a historic neighborhood when I lived in Stephenville, but I was able to really experience that attachment that people have to their homes, even once the family has moved away. I had grandchildren that would come and knock on my door and say, you know, my grandparents lived here and they shared terrific information with me, the new homeowner uh, that informed our restoration process, uh, informed everything about it. So those kinds of connections and, and that sense of place and the sense of family, uh, Gosh, that's just so helpful uh, as you go through go through all of this restoration. I mean, absolutely. You know, something that is on our radar screen and we want to do, and it's going to happen, um, is a photographic survey of the neighborhood. That's so interesting for Oakers. I said, you know, no two houses are alike. Um, but that will involve like a photograph of the facade of each house and maybe the front two sides. That will bring people out. It's kind of like when you get uh, maybe, you know, you have a new dog. The neighborhood comes out of the woodwork to see the dog. Well, people are going to be interested. That, hey, you know, there, there's a team that's that's photographing the houses. What's going on? That's another way to build some some interest. And in, um, we'll be able to uh, compare houses. Probably we'll learn more about uh, some of the builders, maybe some of the, the craftspersons that takes that level to do it. Uh, but that will be interesting and exciting. All the stories come together when you start doing things like that. Absolutely. Linda, did you have another uh, comment from the chat? Yes, uh, Carol, I think this is pronounced Bayer Hubbard is a, uh, she's from Carter Riverside. Uh, the Bayer family lived next door to your Willis in-laws on Browning Court. So you probably know how to pronounce that name if I've got it wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how nice for you to be here. <laughs> We're thrilled. Let's see. Okay. Um, also, is there a list or resources for restoring a home in Oakhurst? They live in a Palo Pinto stone house and are looking into maintenance improvement. Well, there's not a list, but uh, is specifically for Oakhurst, but um, there are, uh, you know, many different sources that we could pull together. It's almost like a bibliography um, that we could use. And, and frankly, um, th they're starting to be among people, for instance, who restore wood windows, just one element like that. They're, they have put to be beginning to put together uh, websites and um again, sort of a bibliography and a collection of information about craftspeople who do the kind of work necessary, uh, contacts, that sort of thing. So we're, we're starting to see it just in terms of Fort Worth more and more. And actually, it's a really great idea to do that for Oakhurst. Uh, maybe that's the next project. Where's my pen and paper? <laughs> no reason we can't put that together, you know? Well, Libby, I know that the Fairmount Neighborhood Association does have a resources page on That's their correct. website, so that might kind of give you some ideas. That's correct. And if, if anybody is interested in trying to research the history of their home, um, they can certainly contact us here at the Fort Worth Public Library. Yeah, we don't have something on every home, but we can certainly help you find out what there is. The city directories are a great resource to find out about who has lived in your home before you. So um, right. also we do have one other comment uh, from a woman who was raised in Oakhurst and her father still lives there. Uh, she says she can't imagine a better place to grow up and cannot imagine selling the home. I think that's so great, the idea of keeping it in the family. And I'm just really so excited that so many people with Oakhurst ties have been able to join us today. Absolutely. Absolutely. That happens a lot. They just, you know, they love it. They just come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we, we have a, a final note on the, the family we were talking about earlier, uh, the Walkers. Um, our, our attendee is, is adding that they are buried at Mount Olivet. And 
we're married for 76 years, but I especially want to point out that uh, that our attendee is a junior at TCU and a fifth generation Fort Worthian himself. So I am super delighted to have uh, someone who is one of our young TCU students who's interested in this history and uh, looking to learn more. Thank you for being with us today. Outstanding. That's great. We love it. We love with young people. I mean, we always say that young people are so important. Um, I love the fact that this is an intergenerational neighborhood, young, old, middle-aged, you know, they're all there and we can all learn from one another. And that's kind of the ideal. Uh, so yeah, that's terrific. Well, Linda, do you see any other questions? I do not. Okay. I think that's it on the questions. Just double checking here. Yeah, I'm not seeing any that we've missed. I think we had one comment from Gene about a, a window restorer that he was familiar with, I, Gene Smith. Uh, Part of the Center for Texas Studies, uh, he chimed in that that he knows a great restoration window restorationist in the area. Uh, so uh, so you might want to get with him to make sure that that gentleman gets on the list. That's that's great. And and we had a work we actually had a windows wood windows workshop last year or before the pandemic, and uh, the windows in our home were actually done. And it was amazing. People just started coming by. It was like they were just they stop their cars and come and look. You know, it was. It was amazing, but it, but that's the way you learn. So that's terrific. Thank you, Jean. We'll, we'll add that. Well, if that's everything, I guess we will wrap it up. I'm not seeing any more questions, but uh, we can't thank you enough, uh, Libby, for being here with us today. This has been so informative, uh, not only on the history side, but on the preservation side. Uh, I hope that this will inspire some folks in other Fort Worth neighborhoods and other neighborhoods around the state. You know, we have a statewide audience now. So, uh, so I hope that this will inspire you to begin work on your own projects out there. Um, and I hope everybody has a terrific afternoon. Linda, do you you have any more comments? Um, somebody says that they have a question. Uh, they just typed oh. in that they have a question. If you could go ahead and type your question in, we will ask it. Oh, absolutely. So we'll just give you a couple of minutes here. Oh, wait, maybe it's there. Um, oh, um, so on the video recording, someone was asking about that. Um, it will be available on the library's YouTube channel in about seven to 10 days. And Leanna said she will try and let folks know about that. Let me just pop that uh, link into the uh, chat here. Give me just a second. And Leanna, do you see the other question coming up, up yet? Let me see. No, I am not seeing the question. Okay. See if it comes up for you. I think she said repeat about the replay. So maybe that was the... Oh, I think, I think here it is. Um, she says, um, I live in Como and wow. the process of several, um, and am in the process of several historic designations for locations. I have a poor connection, so I missed how to research your home history. So could you direct her to some sources of information? Sure, and uh, Carol uh, mentioned some, I mean, you cannot beat the Fort Republic Library for if you are uh, doing research, you know, city directories, um, there's nothing like looking at tax cards. In fact, that's one of the volunteer things we did. We made copies of all the tax cards when they were still hard copies uh, at the county. Um, they're now mm -hmm. online. Um, any kind of uh, deed uh, information that you can get 
any information you can get from that about people who originally owned the house or bought the lot, uh, you can you can look those people up or, or those addresses up uh, in the city directories. There's uh, all kinds of things like that. There actually are uh, various uh People like Susan Klein, who have done uh, courses, if you will, on how to research your home's history. She's kind of the, the queen of it and the master. And there is, there used to be a city publication. I still have a box full of them, frankly. It's a little booklet. It's about how to do that, how to research, you know, your, your home's history. So maybe we can find a way to uh, provide some of those to the library so people like this, this uh, lady can, uh, you know, pick them up, pick one up if they're not still in print at the city. Does that make sense? Right. I think so. Um, and the person that was saying that they had a bad connection um, said that the audio was kind of garbled. So um, they missed things. I can reach out to them uh, by email. So. Make that connection. Great. Okay. Well, and hopefully she can tune in and pick up what she might have missed when the YouTube video is available. Yes. Okay. Do we have any other last minute questions? We have a last call. <laughs> I don't see anything else. Um, thank you all for spending your Saturday morning with us, especially Libby and uh, everyone join us on June the 5th when we welcome Dr. Gooding to talk about TCU history. Uh, and with that, I just wish everybody a great afternoon. Thank you from the Fort Worth Library for joining us. Thank you. thank you, Libby. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. All right. We'll see you next lady. month. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.